Thanks for joining us today at Lighthouse Outreach Ministries. We're lighting the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, listen today as Pastor Green shares some biblical truths that will shine upon the true light, Jesus Christ. So today, if you've got your Bibles, please go ahead and turn to Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3 is where we're going to begin today. Let's begin in verse 7 of chapter 3. And the heading in my Bible reads, Warnings Against Unbelief. It says, Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, Today, if you will, hear his voice. Harden not your hearts, as in the day of provocation, in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation, and I said, They do always err in their hearts, and they have not known my ways. I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Now, I put a little dot out beside every time I read the words, enter into my rest or anything that had to do with entering or not entering into God's rest. So we're going to entitle today's message, enter into God's rest. And I'm going to try my best to explain to you what that means. What does it mean when God says, enter into my rest, and then he's speaking here to a people, his chosen people over 3,500 years ago, the Israelites, who he said he was grieved with them, and he tested them and he proved them, and they saw his works for 40 years, and we know they were wandering in the wilderness, and we know they never entered the promised land, and this chapter, he's referencing that. He's referencing what happened to his people, the Israelites. When they were 40 years in the wilderness, most of us know the story of when God brought the children of, of um, uh, Israel out of bondage. He brought them out of Egypt, and he was taking them into the promised land called Canaan. But they got hung up in the wilderness, and they were there 40 long years. I heard a story that if they had have just walked straight across the wilderness, it would have only took them 12 days. But they walked around and around and around in the wilderness. They wandered there in the wilderness for 40 years. And why? Why? Now, here's what God's doing. He's using the writer of Hebrews to not only warn the Hebrew Christians of what happened with their forefathers. But he's warning the Gentile Christians, us, of what can also happen to us if we don't heed God's warnings and pay careful attention to ourselves. Are you with me? Everybody with me? Okay. So this is what he says. He says he swore in his wrath. This is God that they would not enter into his rest, and they didn't. When we go back and look at the Israelites, it says they fell dead in the wilderness, never entering the promised land that God had promised to them. But it wasn't God that broke the promise. It was the people, and we're going to see why. Now, he says, take heed, brethren. So who's he speaking to now? Not just the Israelites. Amen. The writer of Hebrews, this is New Testament, he's speaking to you and me also. He says, take heed, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of what? You better circle that. Unbelief. Here was their problem. They did not believe. 
They were hearing the word, but they did not believe. They heard God. God spoke through Moses and told the people what God said to do. And it was God, but the people... Now watch this. He labels that they had an evil heart. So unbelief stems from an evil heart, not a godly heart. So he said, take heed. He take heed means pay careful attention that you don't get over into unbelief where you don't believe God and you don't believe God's word. We have to watch for that. Lord, help me to not get in the place where I don't believe and have an evil heart of unbelief. Amen? So he says, take heed that this doesn't happen to you. And then it goes even deeper. In departing from the living God. Now let me say this. A lot of people will teach you, once saved, always saved. But the Bible says here that it is possible to depart from the living God. And it's not God leaving you, it's you leaving God. So you are to take heed that you don't get into a place where you have an evil heart of unbelief where you depart from the living God. Amen? Now, we all ought to know that because if I never worried that I could or was concerned, let me use that word as we talked about a while ago, it should be of my concern that I am very watchful that I do not get over into the place of unbelief and depart from God. That is not my agenda, and I am sure of this, that's not yours either. Amen? Is that your agenda, to leave God, to depart from God? Absolutely not. That's not my desire. Amen? I want to go into the promised land. How many of you want to go into the, our promised land? Our promised land is not an earthly promised land like Canaan was in the Old Testament. Our promised land is heaven. Amen? That's heaven we're talking about this morning. How many of you want to go to heaven when you leave this world? That's your promised land. But some won't make it if they get over into unbelief. So we have to guard our heart and our minds against an evil heart of unbelief. Um, and make sure we don't depart from the living God. But now watch this. Think about this, church. He says, exhort one another, how often? Daily. Daily you and I are to help each other. Look around the room. You're to exhort each other daily. In, exhort means encourage, edify each other to not depart from the Lord. Don't you get over into unbelief. And you know, it takes us helping each other. There are times where I've wondered if I could trust God. I've wondered if God was going to come through. And somebody else come up to me and said, look, God's going to take care of this. Now you be encouraged. God is for you. And that person exhorted me. We need to be aware of each other's need to be exhorted. How many of you know in your heart you're able to exhort somebody else and help them? Then we need to get busy doing it. We don't need to sit around and think about ourselves all day. There's other people who are oftentimes in worse trouble than we're in that need to be encouraged. When a person goes through a difficult time, really difficult, I'm not talking about something minor. I'm talking about there are times in your life you hit a major obstacle it's a big deal that's the time you need your other brethren to exhort you to encourage you but you've got to have those people around you surround yourself with people of faith surround yourself with people who are strong in the word and strong in the lord who will stand with you agree with you and not let you fall away come on you know, sometimes you've got to look at a person and say, I'm not going to let you fall away. I'm not going to let you get away with that. 
you've got to tighten up. You've got to straighten up. You've got to pull it together. Amen. And I'm going to help you. Amen. We got to pull out of that unbelief. Amen. We got to keep watching out for each other. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. You're my sister. You're my brother. That's who we are. We're family. We're the family of God. Amen. So he says here, he says, exhort one another daily while it is still called today. Lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. We don't want a hardened heart, do we? Sin is deceitful. You know, as I spoke a while ago, we don't even see worry as sin. But the Bible says it is. We see worry as something we just do, and it's, 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 a, it's a wonderful thing. Worry just shows how concerned I am for everything and everybody. No, it doesn't. Worry is sinful. It really proves to God that we're not trusting him fully. But we don't even have a confidence to trust him fully until we've prayed. And really, I'm talking about prayed through. There's times you have to pray through over something and really know that God has heard you and you have that peace in your heart that God's got this. You know, there's times, you know, where we have travailed in prayer. Um, Things can hit your life that will bring you on your face to the floor. And when you get there, you'll look a mess. Amen? I mean, I've looked a mess in the floor before as I travailed before the Lord, as I labored before the Lord, as I prayed, Oh, God, turn this situation around. Don't let this go this way. This is not your best. This is not your best. But God, turn it around. Amen. When you begin to cry out to the Lord and you ask God to turn it around, He can turn it around. He can change anybody. He can fix anything. But we need to keep on praying. Come on, the, the effectual, fervent prayers of a righteous man or woman of God avails much. That means makes much dynamic power of God available in that situation. If you need God's power to fix something, you know, sometimes we look at things, there's absolutely no way it's going to get fixed unless God does it, right? There's no way we feel like we're going to get through this or get to this unless God helps us. It, we're going to, we just can't do it. But the effectual fervent prayers of a righteous man or woman, a man or woman who's in right standing with God, when we start praying, it makes much dynamic power available in that situation. In other words, God's power goes to work in that situation we're praying about. And you may not see that God is working, but you know in your heart that he said he would work all things together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So when you pray, you have to know what his word says so you can stand on it. Amen? We're standing on the promises of God. So this is what they were doing. They knew God's word. They knew God's promises, but they didn't believe them. That's the most horrible thing that we can do is to know God and know what he said and know what he's promised. But we just don't believe. We're not like those who don't believe. And who fall away from the faith. I'm, I'm going to say that one more time. We are not like those who don't believe and who fall away from the faith. Amen. We're going to continue. How long? Somebody say till the end. We have to continue in the faith until the end. When is the end? When you see Jesus face to face, then you can relax. <laughs> and, and actually, I don't mean that we need to work for our salvation, but we need to enter into his rest. And I'm going to get to explaining that a little bit more in just a minute. 
He said, for we are made partakers of Christ. If. Everybody circle that little word or note that little word, if. It's a two-letter word in your Bible. Now let's read it again. We are made partakers of Christ if. That means it's conditional. It's based on what we do also. If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast until when? Okay, so we began in faith, right? Jesus gave us our first incentive to believe him. We have believed on Jesus to save us. But we have to hold to that confidence, that trust, that faith we have in Jesus. We have to hold to it, and he uses an adjective to describe how we're to hold to it steadfastly. That means hold on. Hold on with everything you, you've got until the end, and don't give up hope. Amen? Hold on. Don't give up hope. Amen? Don't give up on God. Amen? Don't get into that evil heart of unbelief. Okay, so he says, while it is said today, if you will hear his voice, that's the second admonishment to hear the Holy Ghost voice today. Verse 7, he said here. Now he says it in verse 15. If you will hear what the Spirit is saying to the church today, do not harden your hearts as in the day of provocation when the children of Israel, their forefathers, hardened their hearts against God in unbelief and they, they did not believe God. God promised them, I'm taking you into the promised land of Canaan, but they didn't believe it. So they started murmuring, grumbling, and complaining against God. Oh, boy, we can get in big trouble when we get to the place where we're murmuring, where we're grumbling, where we're complaining, and we're doubting that God cares, and we're doubting that God hears, and we're doubting that God's going to do anything. You know, I've heard people say this, well, God ain't going to do anything. I'm like, do you dare say that, that God is not going to? I've heard people say, God still don't do those things today. God still don't heal today. God still don't do miracles today. God don't manifest his presence to his people. God doesn't reveal himself to people anymore. Yes, he does. God, has, God is not the one who needs to change. People need to change. The people of this world, we're the ones who need to change. God is the same. Whatever he said, he, he is. Whoever he says he is, he is. He's still the same God. You say, well, he did great signs and wonders back in the Old Testament, but he don't do it today. Yes, he does. But do we believe? Do we believe? One man came to Jesus and said, Jesus, I have a withered hand. He said, is it your will that my hand be healed? And Jesus said, I will. It is my will to heal your hand. And then Jesus looked at the man and he said, stretch forth your hand. Now, if the man had a said, well, I don't believe that if I stretch it, that it's going to be healed, then he would have been in unbelief. But the Bible says, by faith, he started stretching his hand. And as he stretched it, as he released his faith and attempted to stretch it because God said so, amen, it says his hand was healed and made whole. As he released his face, God released his power and performed the miracle. As he released his faith in God's word, see, God said, stretch forth your faith. I meant stretch forth your hand. Literally, he probably said, stretch forth your faith was what he was saying. Faith without works 
is just dead. If, if he had said, I have faith, faith has to have works. His work was believing the word. And Jesus said, stretch forth your hand. And when he stretched, God performed it. Faith releases God's power to work in the situation. Obedience releases God to work in your situation. When worry comes, if you'll stop it and pray and obey God's word, it will release his power to work in that situation. It's called working the word. You have to work the word if you want results from God. Amen? We have to work the word, which means obey the word and do. It's not good enough to come to church and hear the word. The Bible says, be ye doers of the word, not mere listeners. If we want to see God move, we've got to do what he says do and not just hear it. Not just know it. It doesn't help us to hear it and know it and then not do it. Are you with me today? Say, I got to hear it, I got to know it, and then I got to do it. Amen. The just shall live by faith. Amen. Faith is actually obedience. It's when we put our trust in God and do what he says. And this is what he's using in this whole chapter that they didn't do. And it was terrible outcome for them. It was a terrible outcome. He said, for some, look at verse 16 with me. Look at it in your Bible. For some, when they had heard, did provoke. They heard, but they provoked God to wrath. Howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. Not everyone that came out of Egypt by Moses heard and provoked God. But he said some did. Some were provoking God. And I think when we get over into that place of unbelief, we can provoke God to become angry still today. He's still the same God. He still has emotions. He still has uh, feelings. Amen? God can get upset with his people. But it says, But with whom he was grieved forty years, was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses also fell in the wilderness? So look at that verse for a moment. He was grieved with them for 40 years because they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. They were sinning. Unbelief is sin. Doubting is sin. Disobedience is sin. And he said their carcasses fail in the wilderness. And to whom he swore. Now, when God swears something, that's a heavy word, y'all. It says God swore, he swore that they should not enter into his rest. And I noted the word again, enter into his rest. I put a dot out beside it. But to them that believed not. So those who didn't believe he swore to them, you will not enter into my rest because you do not believe. So verse 19 says, so we could see that they could not enter, and enter means into his rest, because of what? Unbelief. I always say this, it's the mother sin of the church. It's the mother sin of the church. We have to guard ourselves against getting into the place where we hear God's word. We know what it says, but we don't believe it. Now let me ask you, I'm going to give you an example. God says that the spirit of the Lord helps us to pray as we ought to. Because we don't know how to pray as we ought to. How many of you believe that? I believe 
The word of God says that I don't know how, apart from the spirit, to pray as I ought to. Because the word says that, I agree with it. So I confess it. I don't know how to pray, but the spirit does. And the spirit resides in me. And the spirit, it says, and the spirit helpeth my infirmities, my weaknesses. So my weakness is I don't know how to pray, but the Holy Spirit lives within me, and he'll help me to know how to pray. The Bible says, for the spirit himself maketh intercession for the saints according to the perfect will of God. Isn't that good? So, when we pray in the Spirit, with the Spirit, helping us to know how to pray, we are praying the most powerful, effective way we could pray by praying with the Spirit's help. Are you following me? So here's what I, I want to encourage you to do. When you pray, rather than worry, I want you to also say this. Holy Spirit, help me to pray as I ought to about this situation because I don't know how to pray about it as I ought to. So I ought to pray, but I don't know how to pray for it the right way. But when you ask Holy Spirit, who is God, by the way, who lives within us, by the way, he is assigned to be your helper. And then when we've prayed this way, this is his promise. You say, well, what's my reward? That all things will work together for good to those who love him. Do you love him? And are called, are you called? Yes. According to his purpose. So there's the promise. You can know when you finish praying by the Spirit that this is going to work out good. But here's an example of what could happen. You could know all of that first part and get to the end of it and pray in doubt and not believe that God was going to do anything when you finish praying. And that would be praying in unbelief. That's not God's will. In fact, God does not want to hear us pray un unless we're really ready to ask in faith. James says, we have not because we ask not. And oftentimes, we ask amiss. He said sometimes we ask God for things so we can consume it on our own lusts. That's asking amiss. Then he says in James, he says, you ask and you don't receive because you do not ask in faith. So when we ask God, what do we need to do? We need to believe that we are going to receive what we ask for. He even goes another level of faith. When you pray, believe that you're going to receive what you ask for when you pray. That's another level, a deeper faith. When I pray, I believe that I receive what I ask for when I pray. That God is now faith. God is a God of the now faith. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things hoped not seen. You think you would read Hebrews 11.1 1 as, now faith is the substance of things, but it says now faith, meaning a time. It's time now for faith. Any time that you have a need, it's time for faith. It's time for faith when you don't have a need, just to move with God, to flow with God, to continue to do God's will. Now faith is the substance of what we hope for, but we haven't yet seen it. But we still have faith that God will do it. If he said it, he'll do it. He's a God of his word. Amen? You say, I haven't seen it yet, but I don't have to see it to believe it because I believe if it's written, if he said it, he's going to do it. 
You know, today we sit here in this house, and right now I believe that if I fell dead right this moment that I would go to be with the Lord. I honestly believe that if I died right this moment, that it is well with my soul and that I, I've worked out my salvation with him with fear and trembling and that I'm in right standing with him. And if I left this world right now, that I would go to be with Jesus. All of that is a result of faith. Amen? Of faith with works of obedience. Amen? Because we obey the Lord. Because we do what he said do. He said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Repent of your sins and you will be saved. Well, I repented of my sins. I told God I'm sorry. When I was 27 years old, I said, Lord, I'm sorry for my sins. I'm sorry for living a life of rebellion against you. I'm sorry for the way I've been living. But I want to give you my life. I want you to take it and, and help me and forgive me and save me. And from the moment I prayed that prayer, he began a good work in me. And he's not left me, and he's never going to leave me, and I'm never going to leave him. Amen. I'm not going to depart from my God. I'm going to keep continuing in the faith until the end. Amen. And that's the ones who's going to see him. And that's the ones who's going to hear, well done, my good and faithful. It's not that we hear, well done, my good and faithful for doing all these works for me. It's well done, my good and faithful, for continuing to believe in me and continuing to honor me and continuing to obey me and continuing to serve me and continuing to do what I've asked you to do, to love one another, to pray for one another, to care for one another, to help one another, to exhort one another. This is the ones who are going to hear, well done, my good and faithful faithful you who were full of faith you who continued in the faith amen you put your trust in God and you don't let anything move you away from it amen don't let anybody and don't let anything move you away from your complete 100% trust in the Lord Jesus Christ to save you amen I said amen don't let anybody convince you that there's another way to be saved. There's no other way to be saved except through the Lord Jesus Christ. Some people says, well, if I give money to the poor, God will save me. He'll take me into the promised land. Well, then it would be based on works. Some people says, well, if I get baptized in water, I'll be saved. Then it's based on works. Some say, well, if I speak in tongues, I'll, I'll be saved. But that's works. Some people say, well, if I go to church, surely I'll be saved. That would be based on works. Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9, says, But we are saved by grace through faith, not of ourselves, not of our works, lest any man boast or brag about it. You know how we're saved? By God's amazing grace. I can tell you today, I stand right here today, and if it was not for grace, I wouldn't be saved. And if it was not for grace, you wouldn't be saved. I thank him for his amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Amen. Someone that didn't deserve it. I didn't deserve it. I didn't do anything to deserve God to save me. But he did anyway. He sent his only begotten son and said, Whosoever believeth in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And I said, I'll take that. Amen. I can believe on Jesus. How many of you believe Jesus is the son of God? How many of you believe he came to this earth 2,000 years ago? He walked this very earth that you and I walk, walk on. And he was the son of God. He's God and he's man. He's God and man. He's the God-man. And he came to this earth for one reason. To live, to die, to take my place and your place for the remission of our sins, for the forgiveness of our sins. And he was punished on that cross. He was beaten. He was crucified. 
He paid the penalty unto the death for our sins. When we sin, when there's sin, there has to be a sacrifice. Jesus became the sacrifice for all the human race. He became the sacrifice for all the human race. And here's what God says, Whosoever believeth on my Son and what he did for you at the cross shall be saved. It's based on faith, not works, not are you good enough. None of us are good enough. Not have you done enough. None of us could do enough to be justified and declared righteous in the sight of a holy God that created the world and the universe and all that's in it. Think of who we're talking about when we're talking about God. God, you know, we say his name, God, but who is God? Oh, my God. He is awesome. God created everything. And guess what? He's our father. Wow. Sometimes you just have to sit down and think about it. God is my father. I am God's daughter. Whew. Hallelujah. How did you get to be a daughter? By faith in the son. Woo! Hallelujah. By putting my faith in Jesus Christ, God's son, that he sent to this world to shed his blood. For my sins. I said thank you Jesus. For what all you've done for me. You shed your blood at that cross. I repent of my sins. I'm sorry for him Jesus. I'm so sorry. That I've broken your heart. I'm so sorry that I've rebelled against you. I'm so sorry. For all the sins I have committed in my life. And I ask you, would you please forgive me? And don't stop at forgiveness. Please, when you pray to Jesus, don't stop, ask, don't stop at forgiveness. Ask him to cleanse you. Rid you of everything in you that is not like him. I pray all the time, oh God, get rid of me. Get rid of the flesh me, the sinful me. The part of me that ain't like you. I want to be more like my father, my Jesus. How many of you want to be more like Jesus? You want to have the right attitude. How many of you want to have the right words? How many of you want to have the right thought? That even when you're thinking about something, it ain't evil. Come on, even what ponder, you're pondering in your heart ain't evil. Sometimes we'll catch ourselves and what we're thinking in our heart is not even good. What we're thinking in our head about somebody ain't good. And I have to say, oh, Lord, forgive me for that thought. Oh, how many of you have ever said a cuss word, but you didn't say it with your lips? But it was in your heart. Woo! I have to repent of those because God heard it. You know, we sang a song a while ago, and it says, with God, nothing's hidden. There is absolutely, in this room right now, with God, there is nothing hidden. He knows everything there is to know about me. And he knows everything there is to know about you, including every secret of our heart that we think is hidden. So I tell the Lord, Lord, purge my heart. Rid it of anything that is not right. Get rid of, get rid of it. What, you know, forgive me. And he said, if I confess my sins, all I have to do is confess them to him. I don't have to go to a priest. You don't have to come to an altar. You can do it driving down the road. You can do it sitting in your couch. You can do it sitting at your coffee table with your coffee table in front of you, feet propped up. Jesus, I repent of my sins. I'm sorry for every sinful thought, word, or deed. Forgive me and cleanse me. Rid me of everything that would defile me. You know what sin does? It defiles us. What does defile mean? It means makes us unclean. And, and the word of God says there's nothing unclean that's going into heaven. 
So we've got to be washed by the blood of the Lamb here and be cleansed of our sin and unrighteousness or we won't be able to go into the kingdom of heaven when we die. Amen? God forbid that we won't be able to go in because we haven't gotten clean down here. We haven't prepared ourselves. We haven't been washed in the blood of the Lamb. We haven't been keeping ourselves washed. How many times do you take a bath a week? Well, you know, it's good to at least get three. I always say at least get three if you do the every other day thing. Right? So how often should we get washed again in order to go into the kingdom of heaven? If we know Jesus is coming back for us, what manner of lives and what manner of persons ought we all to be? We've been preparing because it's the season, the time for the health department to show up to inspect our business. So you know what we start doing? Getting a house in order. We start cleaning. We start checking. We start watching. We start praying. Because <laughs> we want to make a good grade. Amen. And we want to be ready when that health department inspector walks in. We don't know what day she's coming, but we know she's coming. We don't know what day Jesus is coming, but we know he's coming. And if we know we're almost there by the signs of the times, how careful should we be living and make sure we don't depart away from the faith? These people did. These people got into the place where, of unbelief. My word of encouragement to you today and exhortation is don't get into the place of unbelief. Continue. Continue in the word. Continue in prayer. Continue in the faith. And continue until the end. It's not over yet, so we must continue to be faithful until the end. Amen? we got to be faithful. So I want to read um, chapter 4 for just a minute. Let's read it. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest. There it is again. Any of you should seem to come short of it. Can we come short of it? That we don't enter into his rest? Well, he wrote that we could. And he also said, let us fear that we don't get to the place where we come short of entering. I don't want to be short. I don't want to come up short when weighed in the balance. When God weighs my life and weighs my faith and weighs my obedience, I don't want him to say, you're found wanting. Come on, I want to be living a life of faith. See, immediately the flesh thinks God wants me to work more for him. No, God wants you to believe him. He wants you to take him at his word. He wants you to believe every promise of his is true. Amen? For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. This is now talking about the Gentile Christians. The Gentile Christians, the gospel has been preached unto us, which is what I just did in a nutshell with you, with Jesus and the cross. It was preached unto us just like it was preached unto them. But it says it didn't profit them anything because it was not mixed with what, church? In them that heard it. So you got to take the word and mix it up. Y'all know about bacon? You got to take the flour and mix it with the sugar. Okay? You got to take the word that you've heard about Jesus and the cross, what he did for you, and you got to mix it with some faith. Faith means I believe it. I believe it. And then he says, we have to do it because the reason it didn't prosper them or profit them was because of their unbelief. They heard it, but they didn't believe it. That was their problem. That tells me this is some, the warning is we, we needed to at all costs avoid hearing God's word, but don't believe it. I mean, this is lots of promises. 
Okay, God says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Do you believe it? There may be days that you say, I feel forsaken, but you got to come back in faith and say, but I'm not forsaken. You see what I'm saying? Feelings can lie, and they do. Feelings are nothing more than feelings. And just because you feel a certain way does not mean it's true. Can I preach? I know I'm preaching to somebody today. I know this is going to help somebody today. You didn't come to church to not get help today. You came to get help, and I prayed God help us today. Mix it with faith. When you hear the word, you mix it with faith. For, for we which have believed, what do we do? We enter into God's rest. As he says, I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. In other words, the works that were needful for us to be saved have already been done. Everything that's needed for you and I to enter into God's eternal rest and rest here too. This rest here has already been done. Who did it? Jesus did it. Jesus accomplished Everything we needed at the cross. What was the last three words Jesus said when he gave up the ghost and he died on the cross? What did he say? What did he mean? Everything needful for you to be saved and make heaven your home, I just did it. That's what he said. I just did it. And he died. And he said, now whosoever believeth on Jesus shall be saved. Not you, not your works, but by faith. We are saved by grace, His grace, our faith, mixed together, the word we heard plus faith equals salvation eternally. His word, who is Jesus? He's the word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. Who is Jesus? In heaven, he's called the Word. Isn't that amazing? He didn't get named Jesus till he came to earth. In heaven, he's called the Word. That's exciting. Okay, let's read a little bit further, and we're, we're going to sort of close this down. For he spake in a certain place, of the seventh day on the wise and God did rest the seventh day from all his works we know in the Old Testament when God created everything he did it in six days and on the seventh day what did God do he rested and in this place again if they shall enter into my rest see he did that to show not about a certain day because the Bible even says, don't let a man judge you about a day and this day and that day. But in that, there was another day that would come in which Jesus would accomplish for the whole world what was needful for us to enter into God's rest and eternal kingdom. Seeing therefore it remaineth, that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in. Why? That's the second time he tells us why they were not allowed to enter in because of unbelief. That's why people are in hell today, because they do not believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, and even if they hear it, they still don't believe it and act upon it in faith and do what God says do. Let me, let me share this with you, church. Jesus said, many in that day will say unto me, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? 
Have we not cast out many devils in your name? Have we not done many great works in your name? And Jesus will say, depart from me, I never knew you. Many people today, he said not a few, but many people today are going to say to him in that day that they behold him, we did works, we prophesied, we cast out devils. We did many great works in your name. And Jesus is going to look at them and say, Depart from me, I never knew you. Because it's not based on works. Salvation is not based on works. What is it based on? It's based on grace, his, and my faith in his grace. My faith in his word that I believe what he said and I act upon it. If I know that once I'm saved, just say, okay, today I gave my life to Jesus and now I'm a Christian. First thing we should do is confess it, tell somebody. Amen, we shouldn't be ashamed. Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me before men, I'll be ashamed of you before my Father in heaven. Now, that's what the Bible says. So if, if I got born again, I got saved, I gave my life to Jesus, I need to go out now and not be ashamed. It also says that once you are born again, you should get baptized in water. So you need to approach your church and say, you know what, I have dedicated my life to Jesus. I'm now a Christian, and I would like to be water baptized. That is biblical. If you haven't been water baptized since you got born again, you are in disobedience. Disobedience to what? The word of God. But people will say this, well, I don't need to be water baptized to be saved. No, you don't. But if you are saved, you need to be water baptized. Why? Because it is a testimony that you are not ashamed that you have died and been raised again with Christ. When you go under that water, hallelujah, it is evident to those that are there that not only, it's, it's an outward work of an inward change. When you get baptized in water, I'm telling you, it does something that is amazing. I will never forget my water bab bab baptism. It was an amazing thing. And while I was being baptized, um, Hollis Bradley baptized me. And it was in a pool. We didn't go to a creek. We, we were actually in a nice swimming pool. But I remember that day being beautiful and sunny. And I remember putting my hand here and holding the other one up. And I said, Jesus, when I go down, let it be just like it was when John baptized you. When I come up, I want to be baptized in the Holy Ghost too. You know, because John baptized even Jesus. If Jesus needed to be baptized, I'd say we need some baptism. Amen? John said he was baptizing people in water that had believed on Jesus. And Jesus shows up and he says, John, baptize me. And John said, I need to be baptized of you, Jesus, not you be baptized of me. And Jesus said, no, because the man... The, he was the God-man. He needed to be baptized, and he got baptized. And it said that when he did, that there was a voice from heaven that said, This is my Son, in whom I am well pleased. And then the Spirit descended upon Jesus, and Jesus was full of the Holy Ghost. And then he went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the devil and doing all kind of wonderful things because he was filled with the Spirit. So he showed us how to walk. He showed us how to live. And if you're not living and obeying God and living the kind of life that the Bible teaches, you might need to recheck and see if you ever got born again. There is such a thing as a false uh, conversion. It's called wheat and tares. A tear looks like wheat, but it's not. It's fake. I had rather tell people now to check yourself. See if you're really in the faith. See if you're really 
living in obedience to this word? Is it how you practice living every day? I'm not saying any of us do it perfect, but we ought to be, it ought to be evident that there's fruit on the tree. Amen? That there's some fruit on the tree. That we're growing. That we're advancing. That we're increasing in grace and knowledge. Amen? That we're obeying the Lord and doing what he's asked of us. That we won't stand before him one day and hear him say, Depart from me, I never knew you. God forbid that we go through all the motions and go through all the works and prophesy in his name and cast out devils in his name and, and pray for people in his name and then get told, I don't know you. This is about a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ through the person of the Holy Ghost. You have to get to know God through the person of the Holy Spirit. He reveals God in Christ to us. So not only do we need to be baptized in water, we need that baptism of the Holy Ghost that we can go forth and do the works of God. Without power, you have no ability to do anything for God. You can get saved by faith, but in order to go out and cast out a devil, you've got to have power. To go heal the sick, you've got to have power. What power? The power of the Holy Ghost. You've got to have some Holy Ghost power. You can't stand up here and do what I'm doing today without some Holy Ghost help. You can't do it. If anybody's trying to do it, they're doing it in the flesh. I can't do anything. We can't do anything without the help of God. It's silly for us to think we're doing anything without God's help and His grace. We can't even breathe without God's help. Right now, you're taking breaths. Because God is allowing it. Let me say this to all of us today. Let us walk humbly with our God. God gives grace to the humble, but the proud, he resists. Walk humbly. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, and he will exalt you. He will raise you up in due season. All who humble before him will be raised with him. All who raise themselves up in their pride in this earth and say, I don't need God, I'm not going to obey God, I'm not submitting to God, I'm not listening to God, I'm not doing anything God says, and I don't have to. Yeah, you don't have to, but you're going to perish eternally. You will not enter into his rest if you do not believe his word. And if you do not mix his word with faith, you will perish People say, what kind of preacher are you? Not many people want to hear you. But I'm a preacher of truth. I'm a preacher of this word. Everything I said today came right out of God's word. It's because I do care that I care. I don't care about pleasing men. I don't care about how many numbers I've got. Preachers are always asking me, how many people do you have now? It's not important how many we have. It's important that everyone that's here is born again and living rapture ready. It's important to me that you are in right standing with God as much as it is important to me that I am in right standing with God. That's what's important. I'm not building my church. I'm hoping to add one more soul to his church today. Come on, there ain't but one church, and it's the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is just a building we're sitting in today that I'm thankful for, but it's not the church. This building we're sitting in, it is not the church. I thank God for it. I thank him for pews, for air conditioning, for a sound system, a place to, a comfortable place to sit. But it's not the church. We're the church. Look around you. We are the church. We are the body of Christ. We are the family of God. And the only way to get in God's family is to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And there's nothing else you can do. Nothing. If you don't accept Jesus, you'll perish eternally. You'll go to hell. Let me put it that way. 
Are you one of them hell preachers? Yes, I warn people. I warn people all the time because I promise you, don't nobody want to go to hell. It's going to be so horrible there. People says, well, if I, I have literally heard people say this. Have you? When we get to hell, we're going to party with all of our friends. What an idiot. That is an idiot that says, when I get to hell, we're all going to have a hell party down there. No, you're not. Read the Bible about the rich man and the poor man. And the rich man died and the poor man died and the poor man went to heaven and the rich man went to hell and the man begged God to get him out. He was tormented. Every moment of the day he was in torment. He wanted out but he could not get out. There is no such thing as purgatory. Nobody, you can't die and go to purgatory and somebody pray you out of hell. The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. The minute you're out of your body, you're in the presence of the Lord. And then we're going to give an account to God in that day of how we lived. Let me tell you what, you, we could any fall dead at any moment. I'm not promised tomorrow. You're not promised tomorrow. If you walk out of this place and you got in a car wreck, would you be right with God? Would you go to heaven? I don't have the answer. I just ask you the question because I want you to think about it. I want to think about it. I want to be ready. And I tell Jesus all the time, Lord, I want to be ready. When you come for me or you call for me, I want to be ready. That's the most important thing in life. Making money is not important. Being famous is not important. Having the best house on the block is not important. But being in right standing with God and being ready to go when the trumpet sounds or when we're called to our death in this life and hearing the Lord say, well do done, my good and faithful. Enter into the joys of the Lord prepared for you from before the foundation of the world. See, God did all this before the foundation of the world. He prepared a way. And Jesus is the only way. He's the truth and he's the life. And there is no other way into heaven. We have got to tell people about it. You know and I know there's people in your family right now that don't know what you just heard. They don't know it. And who's going to tell them? Who's going to go tell them today? Oh, well, I don't want to offend anybody. Well, while we don't offend them, they're going to perish. You know what? If we love them, we'll take a risk to even offend them, if need be. I don't want to offend them, but if the gospel offends them, if the word offends them, that means something's wrong in their life. God's word should be welcomed, not offensive. If we love God, that is. Now, if we love self and we love the world, then it's offensive. I like a firm word. I like this. I may read it again. I want you to finish it out. Read the whole chapter, 3 and 4, again. And then if you want to get the warnings about backsliding, this is the warning of unbelief, chapter 3 and 4. Warning against getting into the place of unbelief. But if you want to get into the warning about backsliding, backsliding means sliding back away from God. Falling away from the faith. The sign that Jesus is coming, the first sign that Jesus is coming, is there will be a falling away from the faith. Are we in it? Are we in it? Are we living in a day where people are falling away from the faith? Jesus said before I come back, that's one of the signs that there will be a falling away from the faith and then that son of perdition... The abomination of desolation, the Antichrist, will set up his rule in the temple in Jerusalem and Jesus is coming to take his church out of here. But the falling away from the faith is, one, is the other sign. 
That's the other sign. And this is exactly what this is warning us. Don't let it happen to you. Don't let that happen to you. Do not depart from the faith. Continue until the end. And we will be partakers of Christ if we continue until steadfastly holding on to our faith in the Lord until the end. Amen. We hope you enjoyed today's message. To see more messages like this one, to support or interact with our outreach ministry, please visit our YouTube or Facebook page, Lighthouse Outreach Ministries. If you're in the area, come and visit us at 9437 West U.S. Highway 84 in Newton, Alabama. See you there.